Hey everyone, this is Cobain the Christian. Today what I want to talk about is the works of the law or the works of the Torah in the writings of the Apostle Paul. It's going to be related to and inspired by some of the discussion around my debate with Matt Slick, but I also want this video to stand on its own two legs as an exploration of this all-important biblical theme. Before we get to that, however, I just want to say that if you enjoy these videos and you want to help me continue to produce a high volume of high quality content, I ask you to please consider, if you are in a financially good situation, becoming a monthly patron or YouTube member. You can see in the three tiers of uh, YouTube and pa uh, Patreon, there are different levels of premium content. My goal is to paywall the minimum amount of content, but it is necessary that I bring in a substantial amount of income from these YouTube videos, just given the amount of time that it takes to write the videos, come up with the ideas, uh, invest the sufficient amount of time to make sure that they're of reasonable quality and also manage the discussion and continue to engage with all of you personally and then arranging debates, things like that. So it really is extraordinarily helpful. So if you are a regular viewer, if you enjoy this content and if uh, you're in a financially good situation, uh, please do uh, at least bring that into consideration. The first tier is only $5 per month. Um, and it really, really does add up. So with that said, let's get into the topic of today's video. I want to start by responding to a sentiment that I saw expressed by an Orthodox gentleman in the uh, live chat on my debate with Matt Slick. He was very frustrated during the debate that I did not directly engage with what he felt was the fundamental premise differentiating the Orthodox slash Catholic teaching on justification and the Protestant Reformed teaching on justification, which he thought was total inability. Uh, and he suggested that this was really the foundational difference from which all of the subordinate differences between Protestantism and Orthodoxy on salvation, on justification, come. Now, hopefully in today's video, um, I'll be able to explain why I didn't take that route. But in short, it's because I don't agree that it is the foundational difference. Both Protestants and Orthodox agree that apart from divine grace, man is not only unable to begin the process of developing a relationship of God, but grace is required every step of the way. Divine grace that life of the Holy Spirit communicated to us through Christ is the animating principle of the whole Christian life from the first uh, inklings of faith on our part down to the resurrection of the body on the final day and beyond. Indeed, divine grace, that life of God, insofar as it is granted freely to creatures as a gift, that's what it means to describe divine grace, divine grace was necessary not only for goodness after the fall, but for goodness in the life of Adam. God is the only principle of existence. He is the only one who exists in himself. And as such, the only existence that a creature can truly have is an existence that emerges out of participation in the uncreated life of God. And what I think the works of the Torah are fundamentally about are an expression of this central theme, this central insight. By whose works are we justified? And what does it mean to be justified in that light? What I'm going to argue is that we should not read works of the Torah as primarily entailing works prescribed in the Torah. Okay, so this is an argument that I think a lot of Catholic and Orthodox apologists make that uh, I don't think goes all the way. I don't think it's really as effective as it's sometimes taken to be. Sometimes it's suggested, well, works of the law, that's talking about the law of Moses. And since we don't keep the law of Moses, there's really no problem. But it seems very clear if you read through Romans, Galatians, passages in Philippians and Ephesians, that Paul is drawing a deeper significance from the fact that the law does not provide justification. 
Paul sees central truths about what it means to be human and what it means to participate in the life of God as being implied in the fact that we are not justified by the Torah of Moses. In other words, there's something about the Torah and there's something about what Israel was under the Torah that has deeper implications for what it means for human nature to exist and what it means for human nature to be glorified. And that's why the Torah can serve as a launch pad for discussions of the meaning of flesh, for discussions of the reparation of that separation which produced the problem of death. And I won't try to summarize the whole logic at this point uh, because we are going to see it hopefully as we work through these passages. Uh, my argument is that works of the Torah does not just refer to the ceremonial law uh, or the ceremonial aspects of the law. Read through the Torah and you'll find that there is no sharp literary division between ceremonial aspects of the law and what we might call the moral aspects of the law. It's all integrated as a single covenant. The whole Torah is binding on the church, but it is binding on the church insofar as it is put to death and resurrected in Jesus Christ. And aspects of Torah observance change not only between Old and New Covenants, but within the history of Israel itself. Within the Torah, the central governing principle is the tabernacle. Everything in the Torah is prescribed in relation to the tabernacle and what that means for the life of Israel. Well, the tabernacle ceases to exist when Solomon builds the Holy Temple. After David rearranges the Levitical orchestra, there's all sorts of things in the five books of Moses, which could not be literally applied after the tabernacle had been cut in two and then ultimately dissolved and reintegrated into the Holy Temple. And there's all sorts of things which were a prerequisite for being a faithful Israelite under the monarchy, but which were not directly or literally prescribed in the Torah. So this is not just a New Testament thing. It's something you can see throughout the Old Covenant. The way that you should understand works of the Torah, and this is something that I've come to see more and more clearly, especially recently, and a commenter really initiated this, uh, this chain of thought um, in my mind. Uh, when we hear the words works of the Torah, we should think of the Torah as an active agent here. Works of the Torah, thus, should be accented as works that the law does in us. The law, the Torah, is an operating principle. It is sent into the life of Israel and it does certain things. Likewise, the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, and I think that Pistis Christu ought to be translated and understood as faithfulness of Christ rather than faith in Christ. The reason that I say that I've elucidated elsewhere, but just to give you the cliff notes, in Romans 3.3, 3, Paul says, what if some were unfaithful, that if some Israelites, does it nullify the faithfulness of God? So the question is whether Israel and God are unfaithful. And the righteousness of God is what is at stake because the righteousness of God is that power by which God redeems the world through Israel. And in Romans 3.22, the righteousness of God through, Pistus Christu, the faithfulness of Christ for all who are faithful. That makes contextual sense if and only if this is the answer to the question about Israel's infidelity and the potential infidelity of God. So Jesus is the faithful one who is both Israel being faithful to God and God being faithful to Israel. There's a lot more to say on that, but that's the cliff notes. The faithfulness of Christ is contrasted with the works of the Torah because the faithfulness of Christ is that which is appropriated to the Christian through the Spirit. That is, the Spirit is living in us. He is energizing in us. There are the works of the Torah. The Torah energizes it, acts, it operates, it does certain things in 
the human family, and particularly in the nation Israel. Likewise, the Spirit energizes, acts, does certain things in the life of the human family, particularly the church. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, Paul says. 1 Corinthians 15.10, Paul says, uh, I worked harder than any of them, but not I, but the grace of God which is in me. And let me make this point. If Paul can say, not I, but the grace of God in me, if he can use those words, not I, and mean it with reference to things that he actually did, and if we're to understand that not I, not in the completely literal uh, uh, sense, as if we were simply taking these words isolated from their broader context, if that's a legitimate interpretation of the biblical text, and it's the only legitimate interpretation, Paul is clearly talking about things that he has done, things that have been accomplished in his life, well then by the same token, we can read texts which say that we are justified not by works, in the same light. If Paul can use not, if he can use negations in this way, then he can use them in both contexts. I'm going to try to argue that he does do exactly that. So the works of the Torah, on the one hand, is the Torah able to give life. Torah is a word which proceeds from the mouth of God in relation to Israel in a particular context. Is it able to give life? Paul says, Romans 7, that which promised life proved to be death to me. Torah brings death. We'll get into why. It brings death because Israel was in the flesh. They had an uncircumcised heart. But Christ, the faithfulness of Christ, is that life of Christ to which we are joined in being crucified with him. And we appropriate thereby the life of Jesus Christ because he lives in us. Okay. So let's sketch the Old Testament background by looking first at Deuteronomy 30 and then Isaiah 55. Now, Deuteronomy 30 is a crucial text because the Pentateuch begins with the creation of the world, then the creation of man as high priest, ruler, and partner in God's creative work in the world. Man is to bring the world from glory to glory because he is the generations of the heavens and the earth. And the heavens and the earth is that whole cosmic commonwealth which is made in Genesis 1-1. Man is a microcosm. So man unifies heaven and earth together in being drawn deeper and deeper into the life of the spirit who animates the dust of the ground and constitutes man as a really existent creature. So the destiny of the cosmos turns on man. God plants a garden before his eyes, so as to say, this is how it's done. And he's placed in a much broader context. There are rivers which flow out from Eden, marking out the boundaries of other lands. And Adam is to go out to those other lands, develop, create, beautify, these lands as he multiplies in communion with his bride. However, there's the fall, which is uh, which results in an exile. Adam is cut off from the tree of life. He is driven out of the Garden of Eden. And this exile is what brings about death. So exile and death are very intimately tied together. Death is frequently described in the language of separation. What is what we usually call death? It is the separation of soul and body. In no context does death mean the uh, ceasing of a human being to exist entirely. I don't know why people say, well, how could Christ have died if he's divine? And did God cease to exist? Well, who, who thinks other than naturalists that death entails a cessation of the mind's existence? In any, in any case, that's a tangent. Uh, uh, it's the separation of soul and body. Well, exile is the separation of the nation from the land to which they are bound. A exile in Genesis 3 the separation of man from his home, the Garden of Eden in which there is the tree of life, exile is death. 
That's the beginning of the Pentateuch. The end of the Pentateuch, Deuteronomy 30, we have a regathering of the nation from exile. Deuteronomy 27 to 28 gives the blessings and curses of the covenant. The blessings are fruitfulness, the life of the nation, the prosperity of the nation. And the curses are exile, uh, loss in warfare, unfruitfulness, barrenness, which is a kind of death. This kind of in, um, inert quality is a type of death. So when God brings uh, children and offspring out of a barren womb, this is a kind of resurrection. He's bringing life out of death. As Paul himself says, Romans 4, Abraham's faith is a resurrection faith because God brought life out of his already dead body, which is the literal translation of uh, that phrase. Deuteronomy 30, uh, or Deuteronomy 29, pardon me, then prophetically says, Israel will be unfaithful. Moses already knows how this story is going to end. But it's not really the end. Israel will be unfaithful. Why? Because of their heart. Their heart is uncircumcised. We see in the calling of Moses as a prophet a parable of this. There are two signs that are given to Moses to show that he is a prophet of God. And both of these signs pertain to the ultimate redemption of Israel and the human family. Because a prophet is an archetype of what the nation is supposed to be writ large. Again and again, we are going to see that. Isaiah, Isaiah 6, is touched by the fire of God when the seraph brings him a burning coal, which is ablaze with the glory of God, that atones for his sin. And Isaiah, then throughout the book, will describe the Holy One of Israel. He has become glorified like the seraphim who sang holy, holy, holy. Therefore, Isaiah does the same, the Holy One of Israel. And then throughout the book of Isaiah, we read that Israel in the Messianic age will be uh, brought into that divine fire. And the very language used for the call of Isaiah is used for the redemption and transformation of the nation. Just look at Isaiah 4, for example. In any case, what happens to Moses is a sign of what ought to happen to the whole human family and more directly to the whole nation. So first, Moses is, uh, exercises dominion over the serpent. Moses, we're told, uh, had his staff transformed into a serpent and he fled from it. It's because Pharaoh is the manifestation of that serpent and Moses has just fled from Pharaoh. But Moses takes the serpent with his hand and the hand is the instrument of dominion. Remember, God does things with a mighty arm and a mighty hand. Moses' taking of the serpent with his hand signifies his dominion over the serpent and it turns into his staff. And the staff is the sign, the emblem of his rule and authority. Moses is described in the Pentateuch as a royal figure. Numbers 23, 24, the shout of a king is among them. Uh, Deuteronomy 33, Moses became king in Jeshurun in the giving of the Torah. Many directions one could go uh, with that. Well, the serpent obviously is related to the story of Genesis 3. The serpent was he who instigated man to bring death into the world. Then you have Moses putting his hand under his cloak, that is, over his heart. Very important. Just imagine it in your mind's eye. Moses puts his hand over his heart, and what happens? His hand becomes all leprous. Leprosy is an emblem and a sign of the decay of the flesh. Read Leviticus chapter 14. Leviticus 14 uses the language and imagery of leprosy in conjunction with the language of the flesh. It is a spot which breaks out on the flesh. In Isaiah 53, when we're told that the servant was stricken, for our transgressions. That word stricken specifically has its context originally in the language of biblical leprosy, which is a ritual impurity signifying death. And the servant embodies the life and destiny of Israel, so he takes on the condition of that nation whose whole body is sick from the crown of the head to the sole of the foot, Isaiah chapter 1. 
That's why the servant is called Israel. Isaiah 49, you are my servant Israel in whom I will be glorified. Nevertheless, he is the one through whom the nation is regathered. So he both is Israel and he is the one who gathers in the nation Israel because he is the one to whom every Israelite is joined and becomes in that joining redeemed. So Moses puts his hand over his heart and the condition of the heart, that is, it's infected by death, is revealed. And then Moses puts his hand over his heart again. He puts it under his cloak again. And it is healed. God takes away that death which infects the heart. So when we get to Deuteronomy 30... This is happening in the context of everything which has come before. Exile is death. Death has infected the very condition of human nature. The heart is the focal point of the human power of willing. That is where you make your decisions. You just read Proverbs, for example. The heart is described when Solomon is talking about choices. You make a choice one way or the other, and that is done in and through your heart. And so the death, which has infected the heart, manifests in what we call in technical theolo theological terms concupiscence, that disposition of the human will to seek its good in a not good way. The only kind of existence that there really is at bottom is goodness. So sin is not an existent thing itself. It is a corruption on existence. It is a twisting of a truly divine quality. So uh, the human being, having been created in the image of God, is naturally disposed to seek and find joy and realization in the life of God. But because we have become infected with death, we have both a good and an evil inclination. And concupiscence is that inclination to realize our life in a death-like way. Well, that means in Deuteronomy 29 that Israel is going to be subject to all of the curses of the covenant. That's what Moses says. Your heart is hard. That is the lesson of Israel's time in the wilderness. Your heart is hard. Therefore, you will be subject to the curse of death and exile. But... Deuteronomy 30, it says there will come a day when God will circumcise the heart of Israel so that he will uh, be able to regather them from exile so that they might live. So let me just read you this part of the text. Now, this passage is an interesting one because it is often used by critics of the messianic claims of Jesus to say that Israel was able to keep the Torah prior to the coming of Christ. Now, in a sense, we can say that that is true because one is counted as keeping the Torah if one repents from one's transgressions. Uh, Paul says, Romans chapter 3, that it was in view of the work of Christ that there were righteous Israelites in the Old Covenant. But one is not able to keep the Torah in and of itself in one's condition in the flesh, that is, as a sharer in that disease which came into the world through the false choice of Adam. Sometimes this very text is cited to demonstrate that really there's no problem. And it's ironic that it is cited this way because it actually is teaching precisely the opposite. When we read the passage which says, who will ascend to heaven and bring it to us who will go over the sea. The word is very near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart that you can do it. This is a confession which is being made in the prophetically designated future after the heart is circumcised. So let's just start in uh, verse 9. The Lord your God will make you abundantly prosperous in all the work of your hand, in the fruit of your womb, the fruit of your cattle, the fruit of your ground. Remember, be fruitful and multiply is language which is first used in relation to the fruit-bearing trees on the third creation day and then these plants in which there is seed. So there's seed of the woman. We always need to keep our minds focused on the specific imagery which is utilized. 
we must never lose sight of the fact that there are idioms and symbols being used because if we lose sight of that fact we won't be able to draw out the inner significance of the fact that man and the world are related in this very specific way it is first used to refer to these plants and then it is used to refer to fish and birds and finally it is used to refer to human beings who sum up both the plant and the animal creation and because man sums up the plant and the animal creation the life of god which is a fruitful life the father is not alone but eternally gives birth to the son and the holy spirit eternally manifests the love which is between father and son the life of god brings fruitfulness into the world and man is the conduit by which that life is passed to the world so god's life coming into the world through the circumcised heart of israel remember circumcision is the removal of the flesh means first the fruit of your womb multiplication of the human family then the fruit of your cattle cattle means domesticated animals so uh, uh, blessing then passes to the animal creation then the fruit of your ground man is made from the ground and he is never ruptured from his fundamental relationship to the ground so life passes from man to animals to the whole cosmos for the lord will again take delight in prospering you as he took delight in your fathers when you obey the voice of the lord your god to keep his commandments and his statutes that are written in this book of the torah when you turn to the lord your god with all your heart and all your soul notice the language of the heart here read deuteronomy 31 to 6 which describes the circumcision of the heart and then we have a celebration a praise of god in view of what has happened in this prophetic future god circumcises the heart of israel he changes the disposition of their will so that they seek the good rather than being disposed to do that which would bring them curse and death and this is the words of that confession for this commandment that i command you today is not too hard for you neither is it far off it is not in heaven that you should say who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it now this is one of the signs that this is not in fact talking about the ability that israel has under the old covenant because that is exactly what they say when god descends on mount sinai this is one of the points paul makes in galatians the torah was given through a mediator that is moses israel recoiled they were terrified this is one of the signs of the fall because look at what happens genesis 3 adam and eve when god comes in his glory in the spirit of the day not the cool of the day he is coming in the glory of the lord um he is like a blazing oven adam and eve are naked and they flee when they hear the sound likewise israel is spiritually naked and they recoil they hide themselves and so moses is a human veil like the veils in the tabernacle because the veil doesn't just separate it mediates it communicates while reducing the intensity of the divine presence moses ascends on israel's behalf and it is in heaven that moses ascends mount sinai like the tabernacle like the temple is in three ritual parts at bottom is the part corresponding to the courtyard then in the middle is the part corresponding to the visible celestial heavens and in the tabernacle corresponding to what is called the holy place one of the uh, demonstrations that this set of correspondences is an accurate exposition of the text is the fact that you have a seven branch menorah well the menorah is a representation of the sun the moon the stars the same word is actually used in genesis 1 and in exodus 25 to 31 uh, but you have the sun the moon stars uh, it's sun one moon two and then you've got the five moving stars or wanderers that's the five planets visible with the naked eye and so the holy place corresponds to the celestial or the stellar heavens 
And then the Holy of Holies corresponds to the throne room of God, the heaven of heavens, the highest heaven. Um, and that is what corresponds to the cloud on top of Mount Sinai. That is the glory of God. That's where the uncreated presence of God dwells. That is what Moses ascends to and enters into. You'll notice in Exodus 24, when the 70 elders go partway up the mountain, that they see the God of Israel, but they see him standing on a, uh, a radiance with blue appearance. That is, he's standing above the skies. Uh, so... Let's, uh, let's, let's keep going. Who will ascend to heaven for us? Bring it over to us that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. Well, this is what has just happened. Israel has left Egypt and gone over the Red Sea so that they can come to Sinai. And then Moses has ascended up to meet God in his glory and then brought the Torah down to them. So what is the result of the circumcision of the heart? The word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. Repeatedly throughout the scriptures, we have this image of uh, chewing on the law of God. We see in Ezekiel that the prophet, uh, remember the, uh, a prophet is an emblem of glorified humanity, of humanity with the indwelling spirit, of humanity with a circumcised heart. When Saul becomes among the prophets, 1 Samuel 10, what happens is that God gave him another heart. Uh, Ezekiel uh, is told to eat a scroll. St. John, Revelation chapter 10, is also told to eat a scroll. Uh, this is an elucidation of the meaning of one of the criteria for what is a ritually clean animal. A ritually clean animal must have a hoof, that hoof has to be cloven, and he has to chew the cud, or have the visible appearance of chewing the cud. It's the symb symbolism of appearance which is what matters here because chewing the cud signifies meditation on the law of god day and night the law of god becomes interior to you and how does the human being make the external world the internal world well it's through eating that is why eating is so central to the language of participation and union in the scriptures Jesus says, if you are unfaithful, I will spit you out of my mouth. Well, that means you are in his mouth. There is a mutual interiority between Christ and the church, and that is a marriage. You shall become one flesh, and marriage is celebrated and enacted in a marriage feast. You are what you eat. You uh, take the food. It becomes interior to you. So if you eat the same things, bride and bridegroom are interior to each other. So the word, very near you, it is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. Remember the name of the Lord is embodied in his Torah. Okay, you see this in Exodus 17, among other places. Exodus 17, the name of the Lord is the Lord is our banner. What happens then? The name, the character of the Lord, which is unveiled in his historical redemptive acts for the nation in defeating Amalek, it is embooked in a book which Moses produces so as to create a corporate memory of God's redemptive actions. And memory is what creates the nation. That's why again and again, they're told to remember. That's why they have to liturgically commemorate the saving acts of God, because God's life becomes interior to them when they apprehend it mentally again and again and again, and so apprehend it more and more deeply every time. See my video series on prayer for discussion of that. Uh, Well, because the name of the Lord is embodied in his word, in his Torah, the dwelling of the word of God, the Torah of God, 
in the mouth is that which enables a person to call upon the name of the Lord. And this language, this phrase, call upon the name of the Lord, can mean, by, uh, in the very same form that it's presented, proclaim the name of the Lord. So to call upon the name of the Lord, which is something that occurs in the liturgical context, Genesis chapter 12, Abraham builds an altar and calls upon the name of the Lord. Zephaniah chapter 3, the nation's lip is purified and they worship God. That's a liturgical formal kind of word. They worship God with a pure lip and call upon the name of the Lord. Uh, the word of God dwells in the mouth. It enables a person to call on the name of the Lord. And because union occurs through conversation, through dialogue, that's what communion is all about. We talked about that yesterday. Uh, uh, calling upon the name of the Lord and God's answering well, that is the essence of what it means to be brought into intimacy with God. And because calling on the name of the Lord is, by the very same token, proclaiming the name of the Lord, that is the way in which Israel becomes the light of the world. There's so many dimensions to this. It's really a, that's why, you know, we just keep going and going and going. I imagine this is going to be actually a couple videos. Uh, um, it is in your mouth and in your heart that you can do it. What does Jesus say? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. By your words, you will be justified. By your words, you will be condemned. So a justification takes place through the circumcision of the heart. The word manifests the inner character of a person. That's why when the father begets his word, the son is the image and glory of his father. It manifests the inner character of the father. The father comes to know himself, as it were, by his love of the son. And of course, the father perfectly knows himself from all eternity and intrinsically. So the generation of the son and the procession of the spirit by whom the son is beloved, uh, that is an eternal uh, reality intrinsic to God's divine life. The word of God, the Torah, enters into the inner being, the inner essence of the human person, and in this context specifically of Israel. And that enables them to do the Torah, to actually fulfill the Torah, and to proclaim the name of the Lord by that fulfillment. That's why Romans chapter 10 quotes Deuteronomy 30, 9 to 14. Okay, Paul quotes this passage when talking about the blessings of the new covenant. Um, let me just uh, read it here because uh, it is such a important in, uh, intertextual quotation. Uh, it's Romans 10, uh, verse, uh, not, uh, verse 8. What does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. What's the word of faith? Well... I'm going to argue that it is the faithfulness of Jesus, the Messiah. Okay, the faithfulness of Jesus, the Messiah, is the phrase which captures his whole life, his whole relation to his father, and his whole love for the human family. And the word is that which joins you to Jesus, the Messiah, the word of faith. And that is why... Romans 3.31, we establish the law by this faith. Well, what is the Torah? The Torah is a embookment, an intextualization of the wisdom of God. Deuteronomy chapter uh, 4 and following. This is how Israel is taught to discern between good and evil. The Torah is wisdom. The nations look on the nation which observes the Torah and says, what a wise and discerning people this is. Well, Jesus is the incarnation of the wisdom of God. So to be joined to the life of Christ is to do the Torah. It is the word of faith that we proclaim. Verse 9, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So here we have the heart and the mouth. And the two are joined and related to each other through the confession of Jesus, which is the fulfillment of the Torah. Deuteronomy 30. That's why De uh, Romans 2, 25 to 29 uh, speaks of those who keep the Torah inwardly despite being circum uh, uncircumcised. And he describes that using the language of the circumcision of the heart. Okay. 
So just keep that all in your head. The word, the heart, fruitfulness, what this means for human nature, the relationship this has with death. Now Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55, of course, has a context. Uh, this is only a couple chapters after Isaiah 53, the servant of the Lord, who is a reparation offering to the Father. Um, and this takes place to fulfill the covenant promises that God has made to Israel and through Israel to the world. I have got a video on Isaiah 40 to 55, but in short, my argument is this. Isaiah 41 to 43 describes the uh, experience of Judah during Sennacherib's invasion of the northern and the southern kingdoms, and it describes God's redemptive act on their behalf, narrated in Isaiah 36 and following, and it describes Israel's subsequent infidelity, even in view of God's redemptive act. That's why Isaiah 43 ends with a prophecy that the temple will be destroyed. Well, this is a prophecy. It doesn't make sense uh, if it is being written in the context of the Babylonian exile. Well, then Isaiah 44 to 48, that describes the Babylonian exile and the return from Babylon. And if you pay attention, you will notice Isaiah 41 to 43 describes straightforward crude idolatry, but Isaiah 48 describing what Israel is like after the return from Babylon, it says that they confess the Lord, but not in truth or right. That is, the sin of Israel is no longer this external crude idolatry of worshiping other deities. It is rather an inward condition of hypocrisy. In other words, those kinds of things that Jesus condemns in the Gospels. And then Isaiah 49 to 54 describes the faithfulness of the servant of the Lord. The servant of the Lord who brings Jacob back to God and also is a light to the nations. So he brings Israel back to God. So he has a relationship with Israel. He's Israel's redeemer. But also he is called Israel because he carries the destiny of the nation on his shoulders. Just like David carried the destiny of the nation on his shoulders. When there are rebels against King David, they say we have no inheritance in David. No share in the son of Jesse. You, sh you inherit the land in David. David's life recapitulates the life of Israel writ large. Covenant promises made to the children of Abraham in the book of Genesis are rearticulated as promises to King David in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 7. So this has ample precedent uh, from the scriptures. So all of this is about Israel's redemption and the consequent redemption of the nation. Uh, we have a servant, which is the nation, Isaiah 42. That nation is focused down onto the singular messianic servant of the Lord, Isaiah 49, 3 and following. And then the servant of the Lord, Jesus, shall see his seed, Isaiah 53, verse 10. What kind of seed is it talking about? It's not actually that hard to figure out, and it's not talking about literal children. The context makes it clear. What is the language of childbirth about here in Isaiah? Well, Zion, daughter Zion, the city of God, clearly we're not talking about literal straightforward language here, is barren. That is what it's about. Barrenness is a way of talking about Israel's corporate destiny. The blessings of the covenant is their fruitfulness, their uh, multiplication as a nation. And the servant of the Lord, Isaiah 53, marries daughter Zion. So Isaiah chapter 50. Isaiah chapter 50 says that despite his faithfulness, they spit on the servant. This is what happens if a kinsman redeemer uh, who is fulfilling the institution of Leverite marriage fails to do his duty by, by his um, dead brother's wife. He is meant to raise up seed for his dead brother if he had no children because there is a family inheritance which has to be transmitted under the system. Well, if he refuses to do that, she is to ritually spit in his face. This is what happens, Isaiah 50, to the servant of the Lord, even though he is doing his duty. He's called uh, a redeemer. This is language for uh, the husband in the leveret system, uh, the kinsman 
uh, redeemer or the kinsman avenger. It's two sides of the same coin. Uh, so the servant marries Zion and then sees his seed. Well, then who are those seed? It is people who are created after the image of the servant. Isaiah 54, verse 17. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their justification from me. Note the language of justification. I'll have to double check if the Hebrew uh, text is is um, uh, is the same as the earlier righteousness language there, uh, but I believe that it is. Uh, their justification or their uh, righteousness from me declares the Lord. Just looked at it is the language of righteousness. Uh, servants is used in the plural here so as to express the relation between the single messianic servant of the Lord and the redeemed nation. Well, how does this unfold? Just notice that the servant has been called the bridegroom. He's been called the kinsman redeemer. And what are we told in 54 verse 5? Your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your redeemer. The God of the whole earth is he called. Israel has to enlarge their tent. Verse 2 and following. They have to lengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes. You will spread abroad to the right, to the left. Your seed will possess the nations and will people the desolate cities. So whereas Zion was once barren, now the nation multiplies so that they expand to cover the whole earth. That's why Paul in Romans uh, chapter 4 calls Abraham the heir of the world. We inherit the whole earth with the Messiah. We are joined to the people of Abraham by being adopted into that family in union with Jesus Christ. The servant is the husband. He's the redeemer. And yet God is the husband. He's the redeemer. The servant, Isaiah 52, 13, is high and lifted up and exalted. Well, that phrase high and lifted up is only used twice elsewhere in Isaiah and indeed the whole Bible. And it, in those two texts, refers to the God of Israel. Uh, I saw the Lord sitting on his throne uh, high and lifted up, Isaiah chapter 6. So there's a lot of evidence here that the messianic servant is divine. And uh, we see in... 55 verse 3 this is about the messiah the messiah is the son of david what does isaiah say about the nation who has just been reborn after the image of the servant i will make with you an everlasting covenant my steadfast sure love for david behold i made him a witness to the people peoples, the leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, a nation that you did not know shall run to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, and he has glorified you. So this is Israel's becoming a light of the world through the messianic servant, Jesus the Messiah. And because the whole nation is reborn after the image of the servant, and the servant is the son of David, well, the covenant with David holds true for the entire nation. Uh, what is this all about? This is about fruitfulness, seed, marriage, fruitfulness. They were once barren. They were once desolate. They were once, in other words, dying. They were dying as a nation. You don't have children. It dies out. It's not a political statement, so no, no tangents on that in the comments. Um, uh, they were dying as a nation. Well, now the servant, he made his grave with the wicked he entered into the exile of death and has come back from the dead so isaiah 55 verses 10 to 11 for as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there but water the earth making it bring forth and sprout giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater so shall my word be that which goes out from my mouth it's the same by the way this is the same uh, word as uh uh, uh, in Deuteronomy 30 for word, um, same word for word, um, word that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Well, John actually uses a lot of this language from Isaiah because the word which comes from the mouth of God and gives a new birth to all creation, that's the logos. It's Jesus the Messiah, the Word of God. He is the one who brings new birth. 
uh, and we see the, the language here in Isaiah 55, the word shall accomplish that for which I purpose. Well, what does Jesus always talk about in the Gospel of John? My food is to do the will of my Father. Uh, uh, it is the will of him who sent me that he is here to accomplish. Uh, he has, uh, uh, it is the will of he who sent me that I should not lose any of those he has given me, but raise them to life on the last day. You see this language of uh, seed to the sower, bread to the eater. I am the bread of life. Uh, and similarly, uh, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me uh, and drink. So we have all of this language here showing that the redemption of Israel, they're being given new life, their resurrection and consequent multiplication to inherit all the nations of the world, that takes place through the word. It's that very word which circumcises their heart and then is active in them to communicate divine life to them. Okay, so there is another slide talking about the New Testament stuff. Uh, unless I get immediately distracted, which is possible, what I'm going to do is I am going to end this video here make the next video and make that tomorrow's upload okay uh because if i make a two-hour video the thing is people will often listen to maybe half of it and the second hour kind of falls by the wayside uh so i uh, hope you uh enjoyed today's video we didn't get nearly as far as i intended which is basically true all the time uh but i think we got into a lot of very important and interesting themes here which i hope will shed light on many uh, uh, aspects of this and other discussions.